The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. And then the second part of this verse deals with the second coming of Christ. And he uses the word appear. Now, he's using it in the English. We've had this word three times, and it's been a different Greek word each time. In the English just calls it appear, which is okay, I suppose. This is horeo, uh, used as appear. It's an aorist passive indicative, third person singular. And it's a reference, the aorist tense is a reference to a different unique time in him, human history which is the second coming of Christ. We've had the aorist tense of the first coming. Now we got the aorist tense of a second. The first one is historical, and the second one is prophetic. Do you understand that? The, we, the first aorist is called an historical aorist, and the second aorist, the A, is called a prophetic aorist. as based on text and context. Will appear, and notice that that's, a, that's an... That, Remember, this is one sentence now. I broke it down. That's one sentence. And remember, the word appear is a main verb. You're always looking for an indicative or an imperative, something like that, to make that a main verb, which means that everything that has just been stated about his first coming is attached to this. See, we've got a participle and an infinitive looking for a main verb. Their existence alone is based on a main verb. Uh, that's their dynamics. So, I mean, if he doesn't come the first time, he can't come a second time. Come on. <laughs> well, that's all this is saying, but it's dramatic in the, in the Greek language. Will appear a second time. This is a main verb. The, you know why it's a main verb? It's because that's what we're looking for now. Before, it would have been a main verb. The main verb would have been to the old covenant. Would it be people looking for Jesus to come the first time? He's already come. That deal is done. Now we're looking for the second deal, which is the second coming of Christ. That's why it's the main verb. Will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. He's not going to come a second time with the issue of sin. He's going to come the second time with the issue of judgment. If you know anything about eschatology. Uh, without reference to sin, it, the, the chorus and then harmatia. The, word, the chorus is what we call an unusual preposition, but it is, without reference to sin. It's kind of dramatic. Uh, to those who eagerly await him. Okay? So you've got a pretty powerful little verse. Now, remember, this is one Greek sentence. Verse 28 is attached to 27. So everything going on in the dynamics of that. But we've got something pretty dr dramatic here. Our main verb is attached to 27 as well. That's kind of important for you. Now, what I want to do tonight is uh, I want to look at uh, four aspects of the doctrine of, of without reference to sin. It's a big issue. I can't tell you how many people in the church don't know this. Now, they know that Jesus, a, a great deal of them understand that Jesus Christ came to die for sin. But they don't understand that sin is no longer an issue once he dies for it. The issue now is will you believe the gospel? Because what he did with sin is what we call the gospel. He died, he buried, he rose from the dead. We call that the gospel. And now everything is about the gospel. The object of your faith is Jesus Christ. And what about Jesus Christ? Not he was a good man, not he this, the yada, yada. Is that he died on the cross on our behalf. Uh, for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. This is very important stuff here. Um, now, in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Paul, picking this subject back up, he says, so also it is written. I remember as a young a student of theology, picked up a little book that was, that I've never forgotten, and I never forgot it because the title, it came from the King James Bible, Thus It Is Written. And this little phrase is used a lot. Now, 
it's the dynamics of it is a little bit lost when it's so also it is written. But this little title was used in the King James Bible pretty, pretty prevalent. Thus it is written. And uh, this guy wrote about this and he said that the dynamics of that little phrase is based on the coming of Jesus Christ. And if you get his first coming, if that's important to your life, then the second coming is pretty dramatic. And he connected those in this little book. Um, I don't remember who the author was. I just remember the title. And I remember it was a great little book. The first man, Adam, so it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The word became is genomai, aorist, active, indicative. In that subject, that, of course, is a main verb. The aorist tense takes us back to creation. If you know the Bible story, this comes from Genesis 2. That's the creation story. And the aorist tense takes us back to creation. It takes us back to the book of Genesis in the second chapter. The active voice shows us what God has willed, this part of the decree of eternity past. That's the aorist of God's will, uh, of his sovereign. We don't think of it as volition. We think it is sovereign. Uh, aorist active indicative, and that's a, that's a reality of history. That's a historical reality infinite of uh, indicative. Notice it's a living, a living soul. And, of course, that's in a moment we'll see. The last Adam, the, uh, the reason there is a line through became, it's not in the original text. It's not there. That is not there. It's understood from the first Adam. If, if, if the first Adam, now, it, you know, you can't play iffy, iffy history with God, but if, if the first man hadn't screwed up, there would be no reason for the second man to come as an offering for sin. Apparently, he would have come just as a second coming person for judgment of some sort or rewards but of course that didn't work that way and so this becomes very important the first Adam and the last Adam the last Adam is Jesus Christ the last Adam a life-giving a life-giving spirit now when you go back to the book of Genesis you read about this for example the the first Adam the Genesis uh, 2 7 and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of lives. It's Nisha Mahaim in the Hebrew, and the I am is plural. See it? No, I didn't write it. <laughs> but it's C H A Y Y I M. That's the word for lives. It breathed in him Nisha Mahaim, the breath of lives. Just like death, dying you will die. Then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed, God breathed into his nostrils, the breath, he, God breathed into his nostrils, the breath of lives, and man became a living soul. If your Bible says being, it's uh, nephesh in the Hebrew, and it means soul. In the Old Testament, they didn't look like we do in the Greek. The Greek is a very technical about the makeup of man. The, the Greeks, and, and God allowed that to understand this, is a body, soul, and spirit. Now, that's always been true, but in the Old Testament, they used the word nephesh, soul, as the whole unit. The whole unit. In other words, the body, soul, and spirit. <clears throat> they used it as a whole unit. And so this comes out. Uh, man became a living being or soul, nephesh. And the reason God breathed into him <clears throat> by divine decree, the breath of lives, is because God created man, according to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, created man after his likeness and image. Except in the Hebrew, it doesn't, it carries a different idea, and that is the us. We will make man in our image and he's talking about God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit he's talking about the Godhead <clears throat> we've been made and and look at we're and he breathes a life into us 
and we become a living soul that walks, breathes, and talks. Right? Most of the time. Once, now listen to me, once Adam, once God breathed the breath of life into him, he became a living being, a living soul, and reflected the image of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the visible image of God. See, that's that John that John passage, you know, that John 10 business, that John 10, 28 through 30 business. If you've seen the father, if, if you've seen me, you've seen the father business. All right. Now, when Adam sinned, this is what got, this is what got destroyed. And the only way it comes back is through salvation and then the image of Christ. I mean, what is the issue? Listen, the, the unbeliever, the unbeliever created in the image and likeness of God has been marred. The image has been marred through Adam's sin. And the only way that can be restored is for you to be born again. And when you're born again, part of that is to bring back the character of Christ in the visible form. And that's done through the power of the Holy Spirit in the church age. We, we, that's the dynamic of our Christian life. The last Adam, now watch, the first Adam became a living soul, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. I discussed the first Adam. Let's look at the last Adam. How was this? How does that work? The last Adam, we know him to be Jesus Christ, came into the world. Now, why did he come in to die on a cross for our sins? What's, what's the deal for that? What's the deal for us being alive? What's the deal for us? It says, it says that the last Adam became, that which is not there, but it's working off the other one, the main verb. See, that's a participle working off a main verb. Do you see the word gives it's where it says the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Do you see that? That's a participle. The action of the present indicative works in conjunction with the main verb, the dynamics of it. <clears throat> and so what we have here, uh, Christ came into the world. The issue is sin, but the benefit is a restored. Our spirit gets restored and what part of our spirit gets restored is the image. We were made to be the image of Christ in the Godhead. He's the only visible member. Come on. He's the only visible member. Okay. <clears throat> so how does that work? Well, here's how it works under a new covenant. Here's how it works. Because this is the last Adam. That's incarnation. The whole deal of why Christ came to earth. This is part of that. Who also, the last Adam, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter of the law, but of the Holy Spirit. For the letter, Mosaic law, kills. But the Spirit, Holy Spirit, gives life. See, it's a, see that word? Gives life. That's giving life, giving life. And what he's talking about is spiritual life. And what is that? What is the dynamics of that? The dynamics of that is the image of Christ. That's the dynamics. We bear witness through the Holy Spirit. We bear witness of the evidence of the reality of Christ. Our life is living testimony of evidence that Christ came and was successful in his mission. For we aren't just, listen, when we got born again, we got born again to reflect the image of Christ. That is done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? That's exactly what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, 6 who also made us adequate servants of the new covenant, 
not of the letter of the law, but of the Holy Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Present acting of indicative gives life. Gives life. Spiritual life. Spiritual life. And he goes on in verses, he goes on in verses um, 17 and 18 in the th Second Corinthians 3. In verses 17 and 18, he talks about this is what transformation is all about. Paul talks about in Colossians 3, he talks about in, in Ephesians 4. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about transformation. Transformation. Transformation into the image likeness of Jesus Christ. It's done through the power of the word, faith. It's done by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, filling. And so this is a very important issue. In John 6, 63, Jesus is trying to teach his disciples this principle. that Now, it comes with a new covenant, right? Now, he's trying to teach them this principle. And he tells them in John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life. Same word, see that? Makes life. Makes life. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The Word of God. Listen, the Word of God is spirit and life. It's spiritual. We're talking about spiritual. We're not talking about human. We're talking about spiritual. The Word of God. That's, that's the power of Hebrews 4.12. The word of God at work, the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrows and becomes a critic of the thoughts and intentions of the human heart. Now, how does that work? It's a dead book. How does that become alive? Under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Pretty powerful idea, people. And that whole process is transformation. That whole process, it's transforming us from uh, an image within ourself into an image that is not within ourself apart from Christ. And when that happens, that transformation, we become the evidence of the absoluteness of redemption, of salvation with the first coming of Christ. And we're the ones who are looking forward to his return. I mean, the world doesn't look for the second coming of Christ. They haven't, they haven't figured out the first coming. If you don't figure out the first coming, the second coming has no meaning. Didn't to my life. It is the spirit who gives life. It is the spirit who gives life to life. It is the spirit. Spiritual life. It is the Holy Spirit. That brings, that's why it's called spiritual because of the word spirit. And that's very important. Listen, the Holy Spirit bringing life to us is one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit and salvation. You need to keep that process going. When you start walking in the power of the Holy Spirit on a regular, consistent basis in your life, transformation starting to work with the Word of God forming you into the image of, of Jesus Christ. Visible image to other people. People go like, what's happened to you? People you live with say that. What's going on with you? You used to be so rough around the edges. That's a nice way of saying you were a jerk. Now you're a halfway decent person. What's going on? And there's your chance to give them the, give them a, the story of, of transformation because what, they're at, what they are evidencing in your life is transformation. And you don't have to coax it out of people. They'll blurt it out. You don't have to coax it out of people. Well, look at me. I'm wearing my cross today. I must be. Normally, I put it inside and hide it. But today, I'm wearing it out there. Look what I've achieved. And people go like, you're still a jerk. And you go like, well, I guess transformation is not working. <laughs> I mean, it, it is the evidence. It is the evidence of the manifestation of Christ alive, active in your life. And the deeper you get into transformation, the more he is the reason for you living.
And you know that in your head, in your heart, you know that. And that's a, that's a, that's a wonderful breakthrough in your own soul when you go like, you know what? There are a lot of things I could lose in my life. But I'll tell you, there's one thing I cannot afford to lose, and that's my relationship with Jesus Christ. No way, Jose. And when that really clicks in and you go like, man, I wouldn't change this. I am not, I am not changing this at all. You know you're in deep trans transformation. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sell what I have for a bowl of soup for anything. The devil always tries to get to cheap, you know. The second thing, that's a very, in, in other words, look, here, here, here are a couple of verses you ought to write on your paper down here before I leave point one. You, are, you ought to write Romans 12 too, and you ought to write Ephesians 4.23 because you already have 2 Corinthians 3.6. Uh, uh, Ephesians 4.23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Uh, Romans 12.2 and then Ephesians 4.23. The second point is that the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm going to show you something that, you know, often when we read the Gospels, we read it from deep out of New Testament thinking, New Covenant thinking. What you ought to do is go in it and take a fresh look at what he's really saying. Now, I'll give you a passage where we, we misread. It's okay, but because we read into it, our theology under New Covenant theology. If you're a student of the Word of God, you're deep into New Covenant theology. And so when we read the Gospels, and we don't even have Christ on the cross yet, we read things and then interpret them, and that's okay, but, we, but it's okay to do that in your growth, but if you're going to explain it to somebody, you can't do that. unless. So I want to give you a passage where he does it. I'm going to give you a passage. The cross of Jesus, here's my point. The cross of Jesus Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ becomes the symbol under the new covenant, becomes the symbol of grace redemption in the church age of the new covenant. You'll see people wear it with great honor and distinction, don't they? They wear a cross. People that know Christ, they wear it. Now, we know we don't have to wear it. We're, you know, if, if you're into transformation, he, he shines it anyhow. But it's become an enormous symbol, and, and that's okay. It's nothing wrong with wearing a cross. It's a great symbol. But here's, here's a verse. Here's a verse that, uh, that Jesus says that people read it out of deep into New Covenant thinking. They read into it. All right, here's what he said. He's with his disciples. This is, if you read on in Luke 9, this is eight days. He tells them this day. Now, it's really important because I can't read the whole chapter to you. When he makes this statement, which I'm about to read to you, he says that eight days, eight days before the transfiguration. You remember the transfiguration? Oh, do you? Uh -huh. You think you know it. Who'd he meet with? Who'd he meet with on the mountain? Other than his disciples, who'd he meet with? Elijah. Moses and who? Elijah. Elijah. Oh, good. I love that. And he took, his th took th three disciples with him, agreed? Peter, James, and John, right? The three amigos. Peter, James, and John. Of course, they did what they typically did. They fell asleep in Bible class. <laughs> yeah, they fell asleep in Bible class. But this is really important because eight days before the transfiguration, now you would have thought the transfiguration would have changed these guys' life forever. Would you not have thought that? Uh, Jesus meeting with Moses and Elijah. And you know what they talked about? They talked about him completing the mission on the cross. That's the whole point of transfiguration. It's what they, those three, Moses, Elijah, and what Jesus talked about that had to be complete. Because these are the big guys in the second coming. But there will be no second coming unless you complete the mission on the first. That is all the discussion. All right. Now I got my disciples there. They go to sleep because they, they love the way Jesus teaches. He just puts them to sleep and they feel so good about it. Here's what he says. 
eight days before the transfiguration. God's always eight days ahead of you. That's a week and a day, right? So however you think your day, I mean, people all the time, I, 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 what kind of a week are you having? I'll say, and they'll go like, oh, it sucks. It's terrible. I go like, hmm, hmm. You must have been at the transfiguration with the disciples. <laughs> Listen to what he said. This is really important. Here's what he said. He was saying to them all, if third class condition, maybe it's true, maybe it won't. If anybody wishes, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Well, I mean, he knew the answer to that question. But anyhow, we're eight days out. We'll know the answer eight days from now. If anyone wishes to come after me, and he gives them an A, B, and C. Multiple choice. Multiple choice. Gives them A, B, and C. If anybody, if anybody wishes, and they all wish this, they, and they all have fulfilled that wish. They've thrown their, their penny in the wishing well, and they've, they followed him. He says, if anybody will come after me, let him, one, deny himself, two, take up his cross daily. Now, what do you suppose that means? What, what, what do you suppose that could possibly mean? He hasn't gone to the cross. Right? He's not going to the cross yet. What's he talking about? Well, you'd have to read on because he goes on to explain it. He goes on to explain what he means, take up my cross daily. He goes on to explain. He says, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. They're going to, they're going to kill me. Uh, they're going to bury me. And three days later, I'm going to be raised from the dead. See, the cross he's asking them to bear daily, he told them what the cross was. Did they bear it daily? They didn't bear it once in a while. <laughs> but they will, they will when it has meaning to their life. It doesn't have any meaning now. It's like the second coming of Christ. What's that going to do for me? I got to go to work now. The boss is going to call me in the office and chew me out. I know what he's going to do. Uh, Take up his cross daily and follow me, point A, point B, point C. Jesus said this before he ever died on the cross. So what does that mean to him? It meant nothing. So he explained it to him. This is what this means. If you go on and read, you will see that he goes and explains it to him. Now we look at the cross in a whole different view, don't we? I mean, who paid any attention? But they didn't get it, so he explained to them. This is what I mean. If you're going to follow me, you're going to have to take up the cross daily. Listen, and boy, did he preach it a lot. Did he not start? At this point, he starts preaching. Once the transfiguration is over, he pounds this thing all the way to the cross itself. They didn't get it. They did not get it until after the event. Now, I don't, listen, we're, we all are subject to this kind of failure. We go to Bible study. We listen to it. We don't take it serious. We don't take it serious. You blow this all off. As soon as you leave here, you blow it off, off and say, well, that's just probably Ron's opinion. I ain't told you anything that's not in the Word of God. It ain't my opinion. I'm not smart enough to think this. Jesus said this during his ministry prior to the cross. If you read the whole context, 18 through 27. In Luke 9, 22, he says, The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the priests, and the scribes. That's the whole religious system of, of the teaching mechanism of the Jewish age. And be killed and be raised on the third day. This comes back in discussion, by the way, in Acts, the second chapter at Pentecost. I put that on your paper, verse 23 and 24. Later, Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, The word of the cross. What do you think that means? means the gospel. The word of the cross now is the gospel. That Christ died on the cross on, on behalf of the sins of the world, was buried and raised from the dead. Third now, now it's, been, it's called the word of the cross. And he says the word of the cross, i.e. the gospel, is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. And sure, certainly it is. So, 
Paul writes in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. What's the gospel? It's the power of the cross. It's the, it's the power of the word of the cross, the message of the cross. Let me tell you what the world needs. They need to understand the message of the cross. They need to hear it from somebody who has been nailed to the cross and been raised by the power of God. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is working in your life today and will work in your life forever. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation. That's the first coming. That's not the second coming. Right? That's the first coming. To everyone who believes. To the Jew first and then to the Greek. In Galatians 6.14, Paul writes, and may it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. See the word cross now? See the dynamics? Of it? When he first said this, when he first taught this, nobody got it. He explained it, but they still didn't get it. Because they couldn't imagine through their previous teachings that the Messiah could ever die and establish a kingdom. And so for Paul, may I never boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ through which the world, ha listen to me now, because you miss this, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You know what that is? That's suffering for Christ to preach the message to the world. And you, you want to know what he went through? Read 2 Corinthians 11 chapter sometime. And let me tell you, this guy went through, this guy went through the ringer to preach the gospel. And he never, he never, no matter what he went through, he still preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, he calls it being crucified, being crucified to the world. You see, for Paul, that was taking up the cross of Jesus Christ daily. I mean, if somebody just looks cross-eyed at, at us when we talk spiritually, we shut up. We wouldn't want to offend anybody. Just let them go to hell on their own. Let's, let's not interfere with it. Let's not interfere with it. Everybody has a choice. They don't have a choice until they hear it. What do you mean they have a choice? They don't have a choice if you shut up. You got to give them in order for them to have a choice. What do you mean it's their choice? It's their choice after you explain it. It's not their choice before they do. Jeez. John 1, 29. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that's come, away, that's come to take away the sin of the world. This is the propitiation in 1 John 2, 2, that Christ is coming into the world to save sinners. The propitiation to appease the wrath of God. He came to die for the sin of the world. Listen, at least give them, the, give them the gospel and let the choice lie with them. There is no choice if they don't hear the gospel. I'm so glad somebody did that with me. You know, they hung in there with me until they finally, they'd give me a little piece here and a little piece there. And finally, finally, I just would give me the whole cheese. And so they sat me down one day and gave me the whole cheese instead of giving me a nibble here. But it's all I wanted, a little nibble here and a little nibble there. And they just walked away and said, okay, listen, when you're interested, I, we'll talk. It, listen, I did that for about a year before, I, you know, I was willing to take the whole cheese. And I kept going back to the person that kept feeding me cheese. Just like a good rat of the world. Here's the third point. An example of salvation without reference to sin. A good example, because now we're dealing with second coming, not first coming, read. All right. In the second coming, a good example would be the, tri the Jewish tribulation believers trapped on Mount Olive. I gave you several passages there. Zechariah 14, Matthew 24, uh, Revelation 19. Listen to what Zechariah 14, 4 says. I, I love this. This is one of my favorite verses about the second coming of Christ. And I, I like it because the the visualness in my mind. The first time I heard this, I could just visualize this. And, and so it stuck with me. He said, in that day, 
His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from the east to the west by a very long valley. Now, a guy like Rick, that'd have a lot of bearing to him as an engineer, a civil engineer, right? The Broadhead boys, they, they'd know this. And civil, civil, civil engineers work out there and roads and highways and creeks and valleys and all that stuff. But I find this really interesting. In front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half the mountain will move towards the north, and the other half will move towards the south. I mean, that sounds like a plot, a land, doesn't it, that you uh, get a deed for, right? You go... Uh, 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 who can read those say a mortgage person I suppose and an engineer the rest of us we go like I don't know it's just is it down by the oak tree and turn right yeah I got it <laughs> but see I find that really interesting because what the, what happens here is that the Mediterranean Sea has now made listen to me now has made Jerusalem a seaport see that makes sense to me I go like I say I can visualize that I mean, ships are going to come in. To, Jerusalem will be a seaport in the millennium. Think about that. Ships will sail in there off the Mediterranean. See, as a kid like me, see, when I was a little boy, my grandfather would take me into Muskegon. I didn't live in Muskegon at that point. I lived out on a farm. I, I moved to Muskegon High School when I was in my junior year of high school. But we would go down there on Sundays. This would be a trip for us with a little picnic. We would go to Muskegon Harbor. And my grandfather knew when the ships from around the world would pass through Lake Michigan, through our canal, into the harbor of Muskegon, Michigan. And they used to unload products and load our products on that ship. And my grandfather especially was interested when they loaded grains and stuff from the farm. You know, they'd say, like, there goes our corn, boy. There goes our wheat. See that? There's soybeans. See all that, Ron? That's what we do, and that's we sell them, and that boat's going all the way to Germany. Well, when I got home, I couldn't wait to find Germany. I mean, it became a great geographics for me, and it amazed me that little Muskegon, Michigan had these had these great ships coming from all over the world to us to drop off products and pick products up to take to other parts of the world. And it wasn't a very big place. So when I'm sitting in class one day and I hear my pastor preach on this sermon, my mind goes back to Muskegon, Michigan. And it amazed me that those ships could come off from an ocean into Lake Michigan, into our canal, and into our small lake. And then my grandfather explains to me how they had to dredge all that stuff out in order for, I said, how is that possible? And so we went through a whole nother lesson. I remember just as a little bitty kid, and we would do this often. We would go down and watch different ships come in, especially when they were picking up farm products. And my grandfather gave me this great lesson about why we're farmers and how we feed. We're the breadbasket of the world, son. And so when I sat in class and I heard this explained this way and how that was working and how God is going to split this thing and push this aside and from the east to the west and north to south and all that business, I mean, I just went, I got it. Boy, I got a picture of that in my heart. And so this has always been special to me. In Matthew 24, 28, we're told that the fatalities of the battle of Armageddon will be, be beyond anything we've ever known. Do you know that that's a one-day battle that will be done by evening before the evening sun sets? I mean, I don't know how long you think Armageddon went... But I'm going to tell you, that is the worst war in one day ever. Listen to this. Listen to this. 
Matthew 20, 24, 28, Jesus said, wherever the corpse is, there will be vultures to gather. When it comes to Revelation, the 19th chapter, verse 17, John writes, I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried out with a loud voice saying, come assemble for the great supper of God. You know he's talking? No, he's calling birds. He's calling vultures. It's going to be the greatest supper for birds ever in the history. That's what the Bible says. In Revelation, the 14th chapter, verse 20, it says the winepress was trodden, trodden outside the city the blood from the warfare, that's human blood from warfare, came out from the wine press up to the horse's bridle for a distance of 200 miles. That's 200 miles of four and a half feet tall of nothing but human blood. Now, you might say, well, who's keeping count? God. I mean, that's a picture of where we're going. Holy mackerel. There's, it, it, the battle will be over by evening on the same day, according to Zechariah 14, 4 through 8. In verse 7, for it will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but it will come about at that evening time, there will be light. In other words, that thing will be over. A one-day battle that's over before sunset. And human blood will flow 200 miles, four and a half feet deep. I don't know what you know about the Battle of Armageddon, but there's a, maybe a, a view that you hadn't thought about. This great battle will be over by the evening of the same day. Point four in closing. The second coming of Jesus Christ will be a time of great divine wrath upon unbelievers. Joel, in the second chapter, verses 10 and 11, says, The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful, and who can endure it? Isaiah 13, 9 is well worth your read, along with the great book of 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2. And, of course, Revelation. If you want to get the picture of the tribulation of seven years, you should read Revelation 6 chapter 6 through 19, and you ought to pay attention. Listen, it would be the worst. That, that seven years, there will be nothing like, if you think this little business they got over there on one of the islands in Hawaii is anything, it is nothing. You will find that kind of stuff all over the world everywhere. When you read the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls or vials, you do not want to be there. I've talked about this. I've talked about the number of people that will die. Hailstones over 100 pounds falling, falling from high levels of the sky upon the earth, killing people. 100 pounds of ice falling at several miles. It'd be terrible. Zechariah, again, this great book of Zechariah, well worth your read, isn't it? I'm back to Zechariah 14, verses 12 and 13. Then I'm going to do, a, I'm going to do a study of that book one day with you before I, before I get down and the Lord comes. That'll be a great study with you. Of course, it's 14, and then I don't know if you can handle 14. I may have to pick and choose my chapters, you know, so to stay interesting and not get bogged down. Now, this will be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Listen to this. Listen to this. I mean, you're not going to see anything like this. Their flesh will rot while they're standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets. Their tongue will rot in their mouth. We're talking about life. And it will come about in that day, a great panic from the Lord will follow them. No kidding. Huh? No kidding. Oh, is this one or two people? Nah, the people of the earth. And you know why they're not dead in a split second? 
because God is merciful and wants them to be saved. God is not willing that any should perish. And listen, he, he'll let your flesh drop off your body, let your eyes rot in the socket, and let your tongue rot in your mouth in order for your heart to believe that he is the Savior of the world. Because if you think that's bad, you have nothing what's going to happen to you in eternity. This is the truth. The flesh will rot while they stand. Their eyes will rot in their sockets. Their tongue will rot in their mouth. And it will come about in that day that a great panic from the Lord will fall upon these people. And they will seize one another. This is combat. They will seize one another. And the hand of one will be lifted to a hand of another. It's the craziest stuff you ever heard. That's the army. You know what that is? That's the armies fighting against Israel. And you know who's fighting for Israel in that day? The Lord. Why would you not think that he is sufficient to take care of you? Is he not sufficient to take care of you? I mean, nobody, nobody can even get near you without permission. And if you get permission, it's because God says this is the man for the hour. I've built this man up to have this moment in time. What a privilege that would be like, like Job. It took him a while through suffering to figure out that this was the greatest thing that could have ever happened to him. When it, when it clicked and changed in his heart, God blessed him for the suffering that he had gone through for, for his namesake. How wonderful is this stuff? Well, anyhow. All right. Without reference to sin. That's what's going to happen in the second coming. Without reference to sin. All right. Let's close in a word of prayer. And then we'll do our personal prayer time. We live in the period from the first Adam to the second Adam of with reference to sin. When our time is over and the rapture comes, then we'll be in a period when without reference to sin. Christ will return to bring judgment. And so, our Father, we're thankful that we've had the good sense tonight to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if those are visiting with us from the Internet, may they take this part serious. Whatever they thought up to this point, now it's serious. Christ came into this world to die on your behalf. He died for your sins, not for his. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That occurs the moment you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. This is a personal deal. You got to sign off personal on this deal. When you believe, you receive. So great a salvation. The book of the writer of the book, the, the really the theme of the book of Hebrews, that is the point. I pray tonight that wherever you are, Wherever you hear this message, you will believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, because the power is in that gospel to save you when you believe. I pray that for you. You do not want to go. You do not want to go through the tribulation. You won't. You won't. Because Christ will return first to receive you out of the world. Like in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. And so our Father, we thank you tonight for this study and for this message for the world. Your desire is that none perish. But I'll come to eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.